What's up, YouTube? Today I'm going to be talking with a very special guest, Dr. Thomas Schreiner, about old and new perspectives on Paul. But before we get into that, you have to know some things. We currently have 310 subscribers, guys, which is awesome because starting this channel out, I think when we had about 40 or 50, I was like, you know what? It's already worth it. And so just falling in love with the process of getting your questions and having these conversations with professors like Dr. Shiner, I think has taken it to a whole new level. And I'm excited to see how large this channel will get um, because I think this is the best place to find theology on YouTube because I get to have professors like Dr. Thomas Schreiner. With that said, I wanna invite you to share this content if you're not already subscribed and click any of the links in the description if you wanna consider supporting me and furthering my education. How's it going, Dr. Schreiner? I'm doing great, Nicholas. It's a beautiful day here in Louisville, Kentucky. Yeah, yeah. It's even more beautiful in Miami. I hate to brag, but it is. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure it is. <laughs> so just a quick question. How, how many books have you written on Paul? Do you know? Uh, you know, I've never counted. I, I mean, not that I've written that many, but I don't keep an exact count. So yeah, several at least. Yeah. Let me ask you another personal question. When did you know that you wanted to get into biblical studies and New Testament studies? Really, when I, I went to seminary uh, in Portland, Oregon, I'm from, that's where I'm from, from Oregon. And uh, during the middle of my seminary studies, I was doing really well. And then, yeah, I, I sort of got the bug for, uh, for doing uh, biblical studies and New Testament during those days. Mm -hmm. Who are some of the most influential people in your life uh, that kind of encouraged you to make that move? You know, it wasn't, you know, in terms of academia, it wasn't really one person in particular. I, I, I actually would say my master divinity, t in my mind, almost every class I loved. So, um, you know, my New Testament classes, my Old Testament classes, my systematics, my church history, uh, I loved them all. So I, I wouldn't point to any particular individual, but just the whole experience was what motivated okay. Okay, now let me ask the same thing about Paul. I mean, when did you realize, okay, you had a lot to say or a lot that you wanted to say about the Apostle Paul? You, you know, I mean, actually, you know, I just want to say, I've written a commentary on 1st, 2nd Peter and Jude, and um, I'm on my second commentary on Revelation, and I've written a commentary on Hebrews, So, and I've written a commentary on Luke. So yes, I do, and I've done most of my work on Paul, but not, but it's never been exclusively about Paul for me. I suppose though, you know, I went to, and I, and I love th these brothers who taught me, I went to a dispensational school. And so when I was doing my doctorate, I was still trying to kind of work out in my mind, how do you put the whole Bible together? Because I'm not a dispensationalist. And um, so, Paul, Paul. I mean, obviously, you could go to Hebrews, right? But Paul, but if you're gonna if you're gonna put the whole Bible together, how does it fit together covenantally? Uh, you you really got to dive into the epistles. And you've come to identify with the movement that's been kind of labeled progressive covenantalism, correct? That's right. That's right. Yeah, I'm very close. You had Steve Wallum on your program. I, I would I would agree with Steve and Peter on the progressive covenantalism. I think that's, I, I think their work is excellent. Cool, cool. And you're also James Buchanan Harrison, professor of New Testament interpretation at Southern. How long have you been doing that? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Maybe they gave me that 10 years ago. <laughs> okay. Nobody ever, nobody ever heard of the guy. I even asked Dr. Moeller, who knows everything about Southern, who, who was this guy? And he said, I have no idea. <laughs> okay, did you do any research to find out? No, I know. <laughs> oh, maybe it's good. I know. I mean, who knows? I know absolutely nothing about him. So. <laughs> okay. All right. So it's interesting. Maybe if you find out, let me know. <laughs> well, yeah, we can do a whole interview right there. I mean, maybe it, maybe there's a reason that nobody knows who he is. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to be talking about old and new perspectives on Paul. I mean, even since I was an uh, undergraduate, which is, I mean, not even uh, eight years ago, um, there's been a lot of developments within Pauline studies. It's just like a firecracker every time something comes out on the guy. So um, let's start off with this quote, all right? This is 
as, as it regards the reformers and their interpretation of Paul. The quote goes like this, the reformers were wrong in assuming Judaism was a legalizing religion of works righteousness and interpreted Paul on this false assumption. So here's my question for you. Did the reformers misunderstand Judaism? Yeah, well, that is a, that is an outstanding question. And honestly, that that's a hard question to answer because, I mean, there's a sense, right? There's a sense in which the reformers didn't have the resources and opportunities to study Judaism with the kind of depth that's available to today. I think I think everybody would acknowledge mm -hmm. that. The, the reformers were reading Judaism, I think, through the lens of their struggle with Catholicism in the 16th century. And um, so, I don't think anybody would say, well, look, the, the way the reformers understood Judaism is necessarily the way we should understand it today. But, and this is a, this is, this is, I'm not a new perspective person. Here, here's what I'd say. I think the reformers understanding of Paul was substantially spot on. Mm -hmm. And what Paul says, I think they understood well what Paul was saying about Jewish teachers in his day. And I think they rightly said, look, there is a, uh, there is a polemic, there's a polemic against a kind of works righteousness that Paul is responding to. So when Paul says, we're not justified by works, but we're justified by faith, he was responding to some Jewish teachers mm. who were arguing that. And I think the reformers rightly read the text that way. And yes, it's true that Rome, some Roman Catholics were arguing that as well in their day. And, and the next thing I'd say is that's not very surprising because at the end of the day, we as human beings, me and you, Nicholas, and everybody in the world, we want to justify ourselves before God and before others based on our uh, behavior. So it's not very surprising that the Roman Catholics, at least some of the Roman Catholics of the 16th century, and some of the Jews in the first century uh, fell into the same problem. So if I'm understanding you correctly, you're saying that there's, there's two distinct questions, whether or not the reformers understood Judaism and whether or not they understood what Paul was saying about Judaism. And you're saying to the latter, you think, or you're saying to the latter that they got Paul's interpretation of the Jews of his day correct. That's right. That's right. Now, I would say that, and this goes back to E.P. Sanders' work, I guess, is, and I guess some people also reference Kirsten Stendhal um, as being sort of a front runner of this. But I would say a lot of the work being done on Paul today kind of trades on this foil, you know, like the, the reformers were using this works righteousness as a foil to Judaism, and Paul was, you know, or that was Paul's foil. And would you say that much of the work taking place in Pauline studies today still kind of has that lingering? Yeah, yeah. Hey, Nicholas, can we stop for a minute? Oh, we're live. So <laughs> well, do you need to go stop and do something? Because we have people watching. I can just tell them to send it. Oh, we're questions. live right now. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, I can keep going then. Okay. Uh, I can keep going. So repeat that question again. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So uh, a lot of people still say that the reformers were using this as their foil and uh, or they saw that this was Paul's uh, foil so that they had works righteousness. But what we needed is righteousness by faith. Um, do you still see that as being the dominant view within uh, New Testament studies today that uh, the reformers essentially got this understanding of Judaism wrong and that Paul wasn't espousing? Um, that? I, I think it's really hard to say, Nicholas. Uh, what is the dominant understanding today? Um, they, there's so much diversity out there, but surely there's a lot of people who would say that uh, that Paul got this wrong. Uh, that that is a that is a popular view. But let, let me just put it this way: the new perspective really started in 1977 mm -hmm. with Paul and Palestinian Judaism. That was 54 years ago. 
So, you know, there's a sense in which it's no longer new, right? <laughs> and, and we also have to say not everybody in the new perspective argues the same thing. There's even diversity in it. And, and I know you have a question coming up on this. There are post new perspective views. So, you know, it's a very, it's a very diverse and confusing environment today. What I, my particular contribution, what I want to say, I want to say, look, the, the standard reformational reading of Paul has stood the test of time and it, it's still persuasive today. Good, good. Uh, there are solid reasons for uh, believing it exegetically and uh, theologically. Good, good. Okay, so second questions. Uh, Sanders maintains a getting in and staying in relationship, not only for Judaism, but also for Paul. So at least as far as I understand it, we enter the covenant through grace, but we stay in by works. So how would you respond to that? Yeah. First of all, I think that paradigm for Judaism is too simple. I think, you know, Sanders says that's what's going on in Judaism. There are a lot of different understandings of what's going on in Jewish sources. Sanders' work has been subjected to a lot of criticism. So I don't, I don't think it's universally true to use this little formulation to describe Judaism. There are some sectors of Judaism that were emphasizing, um, that were emphasizing human works more than others. It's very interesting. John Barclay has a, you know, his two recent books on, on, on Paul, Paul and the gift. And I think Barclay points out, look, there are different typologies of grace out there. Uh, he, he describes six different ways that we could formulate the idea of the gift or, or grace. And so Sanders' formulation is overly simplistic, yeah. right? He, he narrows us down to, uh, to kind of one understanding. Secondly, secondly there, there, it, it all depends on what words mean. You know, we get in by grace, we stand by works. I would say Paul believes works are important. But the works that we accomplish are as a result of God's grace, right? Mm -hmm. even, even the way Sanders formulates it makes it sound like our works are separate from grace. Mm -hmm. But for Paul, yes, we get in by grace. Do we stand by works? Yes, in a sense. But that could be really misleading if you think, okay, we stand by, by works, and that's fundamentally about what we do, apart from God's grace. But it's quite another thing to say, our works function as evidence that God has graciously chosen us to be our, his own. And those who don't have such good works don't belong to God, right? Paul says, you know, I'm, I, t I tell you in advance, this is Galatians 5.21, I tell you in advance, just as I told you before, those who practice the works of the flesh you know, you just mentioned the works of the flesh. Those who practice the works of the flesh will not inherit the kingdom of God. I mean, what could be clearer? Yeah. If, if, if you practice the works of the flesh, you won't enter the kingdom. But the very next verse, what does Paul say? For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Any good works we do are the fruit of the Spirit. <laughs> Paul doesn't think, we're, we're in by grace, and then now we're working really hard to please God. No, those, those whom God has chosen, he, by his grace, keeps. So that's, that's a very important distinction. And I, I think you're kind of sensing, um, your hearers are sensing in this conversation, we, we can't speak simplistically about these matters, because uh, you, you have to define your terms. And we have to explain what we're talking about. I mean, Sanders is a great scholar, but I don't think, I don't think at the end of the day, his formulations, I, really, I think they're just too simple. Yeah. Um, I want to come back to the role of works at the final judgment, because I think that uh, interaction between you and N.T. Wright on that subject is actually very interesting. But let me, I have a couple quotes from Wright. So let's, let's read their quotes. So this is Wright commenting on Romans 10 and kind of his realization about uh, the misunderstanding of Judaism. He says, 
for their own righteousness, uh, I think it's Romans 10 too, I may be mistaken, uh, was not in the sense of a moral status based on the performance of Torah and the consequent accumulation of a treasury of merit. Now, that's how most people are taught it. You know, like you grow up in churches, you know, you, you can't earn your favor before God, and that's what they were doing wrong. So the average layperson is probably taught something along that line about Judaism. But he says their own righteousness was an ethnic status based on the possession of Torah as a sign of automatic covenant membership. So how should we understand righteousness within Paul's Jewish context? Yeah, well, I, I just want to look at that. First of all, look at that particular verse. That's, yeah, it's Romans 10, uh, verse 3. And, uh, you know, right, right centers there on Jewish, uh, Jewish nationalism, right? Jewish exclusivism. The, the problem with the Jews, right, says is that they were excluding Gentiles. The problem, the problem is that not, says right, not that they were trying to be righteous by works, but that they were um, segregating themselves from the Gentiles. Uh, now, again, I want to say, you know, I think that's probably true. They were segregating themselves from the Gentiles. I don't, I don't think what Wright says is uh, completely wrong. But, but then I want to come back and say, but in that context, if you read Romans 9.30, uh, and really that's where the chapter break should be, by the way, at Romans chapter 9, verse 30, because that just brings us right into chapter 10. Paul says nothing, absolutely nothing about circumcision, about Jewish exclusiveness. It's, he doesn't even use the phrase works of the law. And you could look at the text, he talks about works. So I think it's so interesting, and, and actually here it leads us astray, that Wright focuses on ethnic exclusiveness when Paul focuses on works. Hmm. <laughs> so, and, and he contrasts works and faith fundamentally. So I would say at the end of the day, what, what Paul is saying is, look, you are trying, he says to the Jews, you're trying to establish your own righteousness. What does the context say? Based on what you've done, based on your works. And God's righteousness, so that's, this is the question you asked, God's righteousness, which I think is his attribute of righteousness, but also, I think it's a gift of righteousness. God's righteousness, which is a gift that is given to us, is given to us by, by faith, by trusting, by trusting in Christ. It's not, it's not given to us based on what we do. So, you know, at the end of the day, even though I think there's some truth in the things Wright says, I, I actually think he misinterprets that verse pretty dramatically. Yeah. So for the listeners who are trying to follow the track. So uh, what, what is Paul's problem is the question that we're asking. <laughs> like, well, what is, what's Paul's fight that he has with these uh, Jews? So, uh, so we're, we're saying that, all right, according to some, uh, specifically within a new perspective, uh, Paul's problem wasn't works righteousness, but it was right. this nationalism or this particularism. Right. And you're saying that, well, yes, that's also probably true, but it's not that that excludes him having a problem with their meritorious or um, their works righteousness, you know, frame of uh, mindset. Yeah, I'm saying that. And I'm saying when you actually look at Romans 10, 3, the focus, the focus isn't on exclusivism at all. Mm -hmm. gotcha. the, focus, the focus is on works righteousness. All right. Yeah. So, so what is Paul's problem? That's the question that everybody listening should have at the back of their head. All right, so right. another quote from Wright, um, and this one's about justification. He says, righteousness can be interpreted along the lines of covenant membership. And to be justified identifies the believing person, so it's about identification of the believing person as a covenant member of God's family. So is justification a matter of covenant membership? Yeah, great, great question. Great question, and 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 I would say now right right has it backwards. Right right is, if I can put it this way, right. God, be thankful for so much of Tom Wright's work, but right is wrong. <laughs> right is wrong. 
W-R-I-G-H-T is wrong. So he, here's, this is very interesting. And I, I, righteousness is about covenant membership. So here's another way I'm going to put it. For, for N.T. Wright, righteousness is about ecclesiology. Righteousness is about church membership. So Wright says, when we speak of being right with God, <laughs> R-I-G-H-T, when we speak of being right with God, we're not talking about soteriology fundamentally, salvation, our membership with God. We're talking, we're talking about ecclesiology, church membership. We're talking, we're talking fundamentally about our relationship with one another, right? That, that, that connects back to what we talked about earlier, uh, right, about nationalism, exclusivism. So you can see how these two fit together. But I, but I would say in response, no, no, that's backwards. When Paul is talking about the righteousness of God, he is not talking fundamentally about covenant membership, but about whether you're right with God. It's a soteriological issue. It's a salvation issue. And here's one, I think, very important piece of evidence to uh, demonstrate this. And the evidence is, just look at where Paul speaks of justification and righteousness. He often uses the word salvation as a synonym. Now, they're, they're not exact synonyms, but my point is, righteousness is fundamentally about salvation. So, right makes it horizontal, right? It's about covenant membership. It's being a, a, how you relate to one another. But, but the reformers argued, and I think they're exactly right here, and I want to argue, righteousness is fundamentally vertical your relationship with God. Now, of course, it has implications for our church membership, for covenant membership. But but that's why I say right as it backwards, because right would say it's about covenant membership and it has implications for our salvation. But I would say, look at the text carefully. When Paul's talking about righteousness, he's not talking about covenant membership. He's talking about your relationship fundamentally with God, about whether you're saved, about whether you're, so what does justification mean? Justification has to do with whether you're right. You stand, you stand in the right before God. So when he says justified identifies the believing person as a covenant member of God's family, you're going to say, no, justified means that you've been made right with God, and therefore you are also a member within God's covenant family, but it doesn't mean the actual identification of someone as a member in the covenant family. Does that make uh, sense? Exactly, Nicholas. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Well, we're trucking along. So, so now we're going to get to, um, uh, by this point, if I understand the Paul within Judaism view, uh, we're, we're going, we're going deep. We're going to the deep end. So, so at first the issue was Paul's problem was works righteousness, right? Then you get the new perspective on Paul and Paul's problem is nationalism and Judaism. But within the, the post-new perspective or the Paul within Judaism view, if I understand them correctly, they're saying Paul doesn't have a problem uh, with Judaism. And so here's a quote. We should take Paul seriously as a first century advocate and representative of Torah-based Judaism. So uh, would you just explain for the listeners, what is the Paul within Judaism view? And does Paul advocate that Jews remain Jews? Yeah. So, you know... One way to put it is some people think that Paul held a two-covenant view. Gentiles are saved by faith in Christ. Jews, on the other hand, can be saved. They don't have to have faith in Christ to be saved. They, they can simply be saved by following the Torah, by doing the law. Um, so that's the view. Do you want to say more about that before we talk about what it means. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's clear enough. If anybody has a question about that, feel free to put it in the comment section. We have some things on Romans 9 that people are interested in the law, so we'll get to that at the end. Okay, so what what I would say to that is I think that's completely implausible. I I mean, Paul is very clear. I, I don't know how he could be clear. You're not justified by the works of the law. Now, we have to make this distinction. I think Paul's fine. If you're a Jewish person, it's fine if you circumcise your children. It's fine if you keep the kosher laws uh, and, and you celebrate Passover and tabernacles and etc. Uh, Paul has no problem with that. 
But I think Paul would say to both Jews and Gentiles, you're not justified. You're not right with God. You're not saved. You can't be saved by keeping the Torah. Um, I, I think Romans 10 is extremely clear. You, you're, you're only saved. You're only saved if you put your faith in Jesus as the Messiah. And uh, I, I don't think Paul, so, you know, what this view requires is before Paul was a, a believed in Jesus, he was saved. But, but look at what he says about himself in, uh, in uh, passages like Galatians 1 and Philippians 3 and, uh, and uh, 1 Timothy 1. He says, I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, a, um, I, I was a sinner. So uh, he talks about his former life in Judaism. I think it's very clear that Paul did not think I mean, we could look at those texts in more detail, but we don't have time to do that here. That Paul did not think, and, and by the way, you mentioned Christopher Stendhal. Stendhal held this view, but I think they're completely wrong. Paul did not think he was saved uh, before he met Jesus as the Messiah. Romans 9, right? Paul, Paul is in anguish for his brothers and sisters who are Jewish because they're anathema, they're they're cursed apart from Christ. So uh, I think that's the whole point of Romans nine through eleven that the Jews must they must put their faith in Jesus as the Messiah to be saved. So this is a very popular view today. I mean, it it sort of fits with our culture, right? Our culture we wants to say everybody's going to be fine. You follow your own religion, and it'll it'll lead to peace and joy. And uh, it's, a, it's a reaction in part sometimes to people being too harsh in the past, right? But, it, but it's not what the text says. You know, I think Paul agrees with, uh, with Peter. There is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. Um, there's only one way to salvation, and that's uh, through trusting in Jesus as the Messiah and Lord. And if I'm understanding Mark Nanos correctly, I mean you're probably more familiar with his work. He is is he saying that the whole concept of salvation just doesn't apply to Jews? And Paul is strictly speaking to Gentiles when he's uh, uh, using those kind of phrases, and that all the Jews are expected to do is to just receive their king, but they're not going to do it if these Gentiles keep you know acting up. Yeah, I mean I haven't. It's been a while since I've read Mark, but my understanding of Mark is that Mark would think what I said earlier, the Jews, Jewish people are saved if they keep the Torah and follow the law. They don't, they don't need to believe in Jesus as, as the Messiah. Mm -hmm. Only Gentiles have to do that. Okay. And, yeah, and I would just say, that's not what Paul believes. I mean, they're, Certainly there were, in the history of interpretation, there are people who believe that, but not, not, not the Apostle Paul. Okay, so for those tracking with us, we're asking the question, what is Paul's problem, <laughs> is how I would put it. So works righteousness, some people have discounted that, and so they're saying the problem is nationalism, in particularism. Well, the Paul within Judaism view is going to say, no, that's not even the problem. Really, uh, Paul doesn't have a fundamental problem with Judaism. Um, he just thinks Jews need to keep being Jewish. So here's another quote. Jews do not need to be rescued on the same terms as Gentiles, since they were already in this covenantal relationship with God, which provided both instruction and atonement. So are Gentiles and Jews rescued or saved? Because I don't even think they like the terminology on different terms. So yeah, how would you, I, you've already alluded to kind of your response to that. But. Yeah, I, I mean, just look at another text, Romans chapter 2 where Paul clearly addresses the Jews. And he doesn't think, he, he doesn't argue, he says, look, the, the law won't save you because you, you, you don't obey it sufficiently. And his argument isn't try harder. Look at the whole argument of Romans 2 and 3. The argument is you need to repent and put your trust in Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah, for uh, salvation. Um, I don't think Paul, and, you know, we look, go outside of his letters, but I don't think Paul would have been persecuted in the synagogues if he said, you know, maybe he would have been, but hey, you Jews are all fine, and Gentiles need to believe in Jesus as the Messiah. Now, maybe he would have been persecuted anyway, but 
I think what really upset them is he said instead, this is clear in Romans 9 through 11, Gentiles who believe in Jesus, they belong to the people of God. You Jews who do not believe in Jesus, you are unbelievers. You are headed for end time destruction. That, that was very disturbing to people. And it's still disturbing today. It's what, you know, it is interesting because what bothers people today about Christianity, the Christian faith, is it's exclusivism. And that's what bothered people about Paul. It's the same issue, you know? Yeah. So we, we kind of know we're on the right track. We have the same, the same objection that was raised against Paul is, uh, is still around today. Good, good. So we're going to move to some listeners' questions. Uh, this question is from John Cranman. It's a two-part question on the issue of corporate elections. So you actually have had a uh, interaction with Brian Bassiano. I think that's how you pronounce his last name on the uh, doctrine of corporate election. And I have him coming on maybe sometime next month. So uh, this listener says, uh, Dr. Schreiner, corporate election is the idea that God chooses his people through a covenant representative. Thus, when God chose Jacob, did he not simultaneously choose his descendants through him? Second part, how can we avoid corporate election being the type of election in Romans 9? How can we separate the choice of Jacob from the choice of his descendants? There's a lot to unpack there. I don't know where you want to start. Uh, well, uh, yeah. I mean, Brian and I, Brian's a great brother. Love Brian, does good work. But Brian and I do disagree on this. Um, you know, I'd say, I'd say two things about this, or maybe three. First, if you want to say corporate election means the election of all Jacob's descendants, well, are they all saved? Or does election not say? I mean, right? Not the new Romans nine. Paul's very clear. Just being, I mean, read Romans nine itself. Just being an ethnic descendant of Abraham doesn't save you. So I think Paul's very argument in Romans nine is: Look, you're not you're not saved by being a child of Abraham or a child of Jacob. So a corporate election, no, it doesn't save you. Uh, you need uh, it, ha it. And, and secondly. The, the the second point I'd want to make is Paul doesn't just use corporate terms. I mean, read read Romans nine. He has mercy on whom he has mercy. Those, those are singular pronouns. So yeah, if you want to say it's corporate, but he's also speaking of individual. Then the third thing I'd say is yes, there's a corporate dimension to election, but it can't be separated from the individual. The two the two go together. Yeah. You you can't have one without the other. So my objection is not to corporate election. My objection is when corporate election is defined as excluding individual election. And I think that is logically contradictory and exegetically uh, a misreading of what's going on in Romans 9. So do I believe in corporate election? Yes, and individual election. It's not an either or, it's a both and. It's, own, the, it's the other side that's saying it's corporate election and not individual election. But if that's true, then why aren't all the Jews saved? Mm -hmm. It's because they're not all individually elect. Yeah. Yeah. If I'm understanding Dr. Bassiano, it's, it's, there is an individual element, but because it's corporate, the individual element is secondary and conditional. So it's conditional but, on faith. It, it, and it is, so it ends up being at the end of the day, and this is a long standing discussion in the Christian church, his view of election is the Arminian understanding of election. So election means God elected this class or this group, but whether you're part of the group is ultimately due to your individual faith. Well, that's Arminianism. I mean, that is a great lineage and history, and it's it's part of orthodoxy. I'm, I don't think that's what the text says, but yeah, a lot of people believe that, and God bless them, and I think they're wrong. <laughs> I, I don't. I think the text finally says. Faith is faith is finally a gift of God. Faith is a result of election. It's not that faith is a condition for an election, but that's a lot of different texts we'd have to look at. Okay, um, good, good. All right, so this next question is on uh, the law. Uh, Scott Heath says, was Paul anti-law as a way of life, or was he anti-law in the way of salvation? Paul seemed to believe works are a result. So now he's talking about works. Paul seemed to believe works are a result of living by God's rules. 
honor your father and mother, it's a blessing, things like that, etc. Yeah, well, the whole discussion of the law is a very complex matter. And I've written a little book on this, 40 questions. I've written two books, but the more popular one is 40, something like 40 questions about Christians and biblical law. I can't remember the exact title, but you can find it. But so Paul's, Paul's view of the law has many different dimensions. But just to answer this part of the question, yes, we're not saved. We're not saved on the basis of keeping the law. But there is another sense in which Paul would say, those who trust in Christ fulfill the law. Galatians 5, 14, Romans 13, 8 through 10. We fulfill the law. We keep, so those who love one another, we keep the commandments. Don't murder, right? Don't steal. Uh, don't commit adultery and so forth and so on. So yes, as, a, as those who are belong to God and the spirits that work in their life, we do fulfill the law, not perfectly, but there is a, there's a new obedience in our lives. So I think, yes, I think Paul, I think what the person is saying, I agree with Paul. Paul says there's more than one dimension. You're not, you're not saved on the basis of your law obedience, but those, those who belong to Christ do live new lives. They yeah. fulfill the law. Yeah. I want you to speak a little bit to Paul's conception of good works or, um, you know, righteous deeds and things like that, because, uh, you know, it does seem that Paul thinks that there's going to be a testing of our works, you know, that our works are going to be judged, that we should have works um, to, to show for on the day of judgment. What exactly is he talking about? Because I, I, I assume he's not talking about works of the law, because in some of these cases, he's not talking to Jews. So, so what exactly is that? What does that look like, the last day and our good works? Yeah, well, first of all, I think you're right. Paul never speaks of works of the law as something Christians should practice. And that's because we haven't talked about this today. That's because Paul thinks we're no longer under the law. That the covenant made with Israel at Mount Sinai under the leadership of Moses, I think Paul's very clear in Galatians 3 and 4, Romans 7 and other passages, we're not under that covenant anymore. So, so Paul can say there's a sense in which we're not under the law. This is why there's so many things to talk about when we talk about the law. But when Paul talks about good works, what, what does he mean? You know, it's actually not hard to understand. He means works that are good. <laughs> what are good works? Good works. That's what they are. The, those good works. So how do, how do we understand them in our lives? They're not the basis of our right standing with God. So these terms are very important. Why not? Because God demands perfection. So they can't be the basis of our relationship with God. No, the basis of our relationship with God, I would argue, is the righteousness of Christ imputed to us by faith. Christ's perfect righteousness. So then what role do good works play in our lives? I would argue good works function as a necessary evidence that we're trusting in Christ. And that's what I want to say. They're a necessary evidence. They're a clear evidence. If they're not there, so are good works necessary? Yes. But they're not necessary as a basis. They're necessary as the fruit of our relationship with Christ. So, I, you know, I, I mentioned this verse before. Those who practice the works of the flesh will not inherit the kingdom of God. Paul often says things like that. He says, if you sow, Galatians 6, what, 8 or 9, if you sow to the flesh, you'll reap corruption, right? Romans 8, 13. Um, if you don't put to death the deeds of the body, you will die. So, we're, yeah, works are very important, but not as a basis, but as evidence of our new life in Christ. So at the final judgment, I mean, I guess what role will the judgment of our works play? I mean, I think our works, our works will function as proof. Okay. You know, if, if the, so to speak, not that I think this is going to happen literally, but if the devil were to say, hey, what's the proof that Nicholas is a Christian? I think God would say, look at the fruit of his faith. Mm -hmm. well, he was, he was a changed person. Mm -hmm. I would even say, I would even, obviously it's imperfect, right? You're not a perfect person. But I would even say that's even true of the thief on the cross. Did he have any good works before he died? 
Yes, he did. Were most of his works in his life good? No, they weren't. But did he have any good works before he died? Yes, he did. What was his one good work? He didn't have very much time left. Do you know what his good work was? The other thief was criticizing Jesus and the, the one who trusted in Jesus said to him, stop that. Stop that. <laughs> That's a good work, you know? Stop criticizing Jesus. And then he died. And, you know, if the devil were to say, this guy didn't trust in Jesus, and Jesus would say, yes, he did. Look at look at the last thing he said before he died. Okay. So it's not, it's not a piling up of, look, there's more good than bad here, right? Mm -hmm. Let's calculate. It's... It's, it's, it's evidence that this person has been saved at yeah. the end of the day. Now, in your interaction with N.T. Wright, at one point it seems like he conceded this role for good works, so his evidentiary role, um, because it, and, in previous publications it seemed like that's not exactly what he was saying. Um, but then did he retract that uh, uh, concession afterward? We, were, we had a discussion in Atlanta, 2010, and... He was using the language, and I really like Tom, and I think Tom's a believer. Um, he was using the language of uh, basis. Our good works are a basis. And I said to him, Tom, I think it'd be better if you say we're judged according to our works, not based on our works. And he said to me publicly, that's fine. I, I, did I ever say basis? He said, did I ever say that? I said, yeah. You, you did say that. Well, whatever I said, according is fine. But the next day on the internet, he changed back. And I think he changed back because I think he thinks basis, evidence, according to, I think he thinks they're all the same. What's the difference? You know, I, I think there is a difference because, because I think God demands perfection. Mm -hmm. And you see the way as kind of meeting that requirement being through the imputed righteousness. And That's there right. are people like, right, um, I want to say, if I'm not mistaken, I think even Robert Gundry, uh, who yeah. will deny that um, imputed righteousness is taught. Right. And, and Ben Witherington also is another one. Um, so wh how, why do you see that as problematic? Well, I, so I would just want to say, I think a simple way of saying it is we're saved by faith in Christ. Why? What does that mean? Does the faith save us because faith is a good work? Or does the faith save us because it connects us to Christ? We receive him and all his righteousness. So I would say faith is sort of like the electric cord mm -hmm. that plugs into the outlet. And, it, and uh, we are, it's not, it's not really our faith that saves us, it's the object of our faith. And so uh, I think Luther got it right. When we put our trust in Christ, we're, so to speak, we're married to Christ. And all our husband has is ours. And uh, which is another way of saying all, all of who Jesus is belongs to us. We receive, we receive him. So I think it's important because there's nothing sweeter to say than to say Christ is my righteousness. And the basis of our assurance is not our performance, which is always imperfect. As James says, we all stumble in many ways. By, and by that, I think he means we all sin in many ways, even after we're Christians. But the basis of our assurance is Christ and all he is for us. So I think Romans 5 teaches us there's two covenant heads. There's Adam and there's Christ. And those who are in Adam are, uh, are, are sinners. They're, they're dead and they're condemned. Those who are in Christ are, are, are righteous and um, justified before God. Because he's, he's our covenant head now. All of, all of who Christ is as our covenant head is ours. Uh, this is uh, another question. This has to do with Dr. Doug Campbell. So it makes me afraid to even ask it because I, I never understand what the guy <laughs> is saying. So the question is, what does Dr. Schreiner think of Doug Campbell and the apocalyptic perspective? Well, that, that, that is a huge, I mean, that's such a huge question, right? Doug has, Doug has written uh, so many uh, big books. But one thing I can say, um, there, there's a book out 
I forget the exact title. It's up on my shelf there. I'm trying to see it. But there's a book out, Four Views of the Apostle Paul. And I, it's me, Doug Campbell, Luke Johnson, who's Catholic, and, uh, oh, this is terrible. I think it's Nanos. Yeah, so those four views are out there. So, um, you know, there's a lot of different dimensions to Campbell's view. But I think the, th I think the thing I would zero in on is really Campbell ends up being kind of a, a hyper Bartian Calvinist, <laughs> by which I mean for, for Campbell at the end of the day, basically the way I understand him, basically everyone's going to be saved. God is benevolent and saves all. And uh, I think it leads him to do some really strange things exegetically. In other words, in other words, he rejects the idea that there's going to be a retributive punishment. And, um, you know, again, that feeds very nicely into the narrative of what people want to be, to be true today. But I, but I just think it's a, a fundamental misreading of Paul. There is going to be a judgment. God, God, the, the, the wrath of God is real, and it will be manifested on the last day. And, and I think... Campbell's apocalyptic reading and his tremendous evidence on God's benevolence leads him to, to squeeze out those themes in Paul. So that's my, I mean, there are other places I disagree with him, but that's my biggest objection because that relates to the gospel itself, right? There, I, I don't see in Aunt Campbell's scheme the, the urgency to tell people they must believe, repent and believe, because the way I read them, virtually all are going to be rescued anyway, whether they repent or not, because God's benevolent. That's why I call him kind of a hyper-Calvinistic Bartian. Yeah. That, I mean, that's better than I could have phrased anything he said, because when I hear the talk of participating in the triude uh, life, I, 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 I sort of lose grasp of what we're even talking about anymore. Well, uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Schreiner. Um, where, where's a good place for people to find you if they just kind of want to see what you're doing online? Well, I have a Twitter account. I, I forget exactly what my handle is, though, because I don't, I, I think it's like a Dr. Tom Schreiner or something like that, okay. but I'm on, I'm on Twitter, yeah. You don't know your Twitter handle. You don't know James Buchanan. <laughs> and I have a, I mean, I have a faculty page at Southern <laughs> Seminary. You can find me there. So, yeah. good, good. Um, also, what would it take to get a signed copy of your book uh, mailed to me? Um, I think you, you can you which book? Which book are we talking about? Any of them. It doesn't matter. <laughs> All of them. I'll send you a big box if you want. <laughs> you what you said? If you send it to me, I'll send it back to you. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Well, guys, please go find uh, Dr. Tom Schreiner wherever you can find him. Uh, man, I love to hear you speak about this. Honestly, I was, uh, I, you know, I read your work and, uh, you know, it's kind of nice to connect the personality to a lot of the writing. So that was good. That was great talking to you, Nicholas. It was a, it was a joy. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'll be doing an outro for the YouTube video and uh, we'll still be connected through Zoom. So guys, uh, please don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Um, continue to have conversations like this with professors in real time, because this is the kind of stuff you have to go to seminary to do. But now with YouTube, I mean, we can do it here every single week and you get two, three classes brought straight to you on YouTube. Also, guys, uh, don't forget to share the content if you are subscribed and click any of the links in the description if you want to consider supporting me and continuing my education. You guys have a blessed day. All right, I'm closing that out. How, how did you feel about the